started and we will uh, review a little bit from last time. I will start with a prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's take a moment to recall the presence of Almighty God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy own Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to start with a question from last time that one of the high schoolers asked. Um, so first of all, review, does God have emotions? God does not have emotions. Okay. Now when God became incarnate in Christ, right, the second person of the Holy Trinity, right, He does have emotions. Why does He have emotions, but the Father and the Holy Spirit don't have emotions? Is it that? Because he assumed a human nature, right? So emotions are part of being human, and so his human body, right, and in, through his human experience he can have emotions, all right? Emotions imply a change, right? We can go from being happy to sad, to being hopeful, to being despairing, right? So one of the high schoolers asked, if God doesn't have emotions, then how does God love us? That was the question. Okay. And that is a really good question. And it's important when we say that God doesn't have emotions, it's not that we're saying that God is lacking something. We're saying the opposite. That God is so much more perfect than we are that he doesn't have things that we have in deficiency. Right? So like I said, emotions are part of us that is changing. It's not a perfect part of ourselves. So when we say that God loves us, right? Oops. when we say God loves us, or when we say God is love, right? it's a true statement. God does love us, and God is love, 
But God loves us in a way that is so far beyond the way that we love each other. That's what this means. Because when we love people, our love is always affected by our emotions. We may have goodwill towards somebody, even if they harm us or mistreat us or whatever, right? But our, our feeling of love right towards that person, it can fluctuate. And it can change. God's attitude and perspective towards us never changes. So yes, he really does love us. He really does want the best for us. He cares for us. But his love is a perfect love. Does that make sense? Okay, so that was a really good question from one of the high schoolers. And this is why it's good to have these, these conversations and these questions, right? To think about these deep things about God, right? Now, to, before I continue, I just want to review, just to make sure we're, we're all uh, understanding, right, some of the things we've talked about, right? So, how many, how many natures does Jesus have? Yeah. Two. How many persons? One. Right. One person, two natures. This is called the, the hypostatic union. Hmm. Hypostatic union. Right. Hypostatic comes from the Greek word hypostasis, which means person. Right. Two natures united in one person. Right. And we gave the analogy that Jesus, when he became incarnate, when he assumed a human nature to himself, it's kind of like talking about somebody using their hand and a marker, right? The nature of the hand, the nature of the marker, but it's one person controlling both, right? In one unified action. So Jesus has two natures. He's one person. How many wills does he have? Two wills. How many intellects? Two intellects. All right? Okay. Now, what about uh, God in himself, right? So we're not talking about Jesus in the incarnation. We're talking about from all eternity. Uh, another way to say that is, you could say, um, the imminent trinity versus the economic trinity. So theologians, when they're asking these questions, they make a distinction. When you're talking about the trinity, and imminently, you're meaning from all eternity. When you're talking about the economic trinity, you're talking about in time. Right? So Jesus becoming incarnate would have taken place in time. Right? So I'm just asking questions about the imminent trinity, about God and himself. Right? Not talking about the incarnation. We're talking about God's nature. Right? Does God ever change? No. Right? Does God have parts? No. Okay. Does God lack anything? Can God be measured or limited by time? No. Can there be more than one God? No. All right. So we're going to talk more about that when we get into the Trinity. Okay. Um, as Catholics, can we believe in evolution? Does the Catholic Church permit belief in evolution? The church is, as I said last time, the church is very hesitant to make any statements about evolution because science can always change. And science is not the church's authoritative domain. Right? But theoretically, right, evolution can be true as long as you acknowledge that God is the cause of all of it and that every human soul right, is not just a mere product of evolution because our souls are immaterial. All right, I think that's enough of a review. So now, tonight, I want to continue on, and I want to talk more about the Trinity. Okay. All right, so we just said that God, there can only be one God, and yet in the Trinity, we say that there are three persons. So, 
we want to discuss this, right? We didn't talk about this last time, did we? Okay, all right, this is all new, okay? So first of all, how do we know that God is a trinity? How do we know that God is three persons? Yeah, Chandler? It was revealed. It was revealed, right? We know it by means of revelation. Remember when we're learning theology, we always have to make a distinction between philosophy and theology, right? or between faith and reason. Right? Philosophy or reason are things that we can know just from observing the world, and we can deduce certain truths about its creator and about God. But then there are other things that have to be revealed to us in order for us to know them. So the only reason we know that God is a trinity is because Jesus revealed it, when he was on this earth, right? Jesus talked about his Father. He talked about the Holy Spirit. He would go off and he would pray to his Father. He said that he and the Father were one, etc., etc. And it wasn't exactly easier for people to understand. There's still a lot of people who misunderstand the Trinity. Right? There's uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. They don't believe in the Trinity. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that there is only one person in God, right? and when God calls himself the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit, it's just names that he makes up for himself. They're not actually distinct persons. Okay. So we only know about the Trinity because of Jesus. There's three basic principles. So the Trinity, is a, the Trinity is a mystery, and we've talked about mystery a little bit before in these classes. When we say that something is a mystery, it doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense. It just means that it's extremely difficult to comprehend, and that our finite minds can only scratch the surface of the reality of it. And it's the same way with the Trinity. So when we talk about the Trinity, we're not going to be able to exhaustively talk about it but we can say certain things that are true. And as long as we say these three basic principles, we'll be avoiding heresy, okay? So first principle, God is one. Okay. God is one, That's the first principle. There's only one God and God is one. God is not split up into parts. God is one. Okay. Principle number two. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each God. So remember we said that the, most of the earliest heresies the church had to deal with had to do with people saying that Jesus was not truly God. We talked about Arianism and how the Council of Nicaea, from which we get our creed that we recite every Sunday, right? it comes from the Council of Nicaea. Arius was saying that Jesus was just the, the highest of all creatures, that there was a time that the Son was not. Right? And so the church responded by defining saying that Jesus is God from God. He is truly light from light. He is begotten, not created. Right? He has always existed with the Father. He is just as much God as God the Father is. Okay. And then later heresies doubted whether the Holy Spirit was truly God or not. All right, last principle about the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct persons. 
And that's the third principle. So unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses, we don't think that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is just three names for God. They really are three distinct persons. Sometimes the heresy against that is called modalism. That God exists in three different modes. And he calls himself different names depending on which mode he is participating in. Okay? Another way to say this is that the in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they all have the same nature. We say they're all God. That means they all possess the divine nature. When we say they are three distinct persons, that means that they are three distinguished, distinguishable, distinguishable persons. So when we say that something, so a nature is what something is, right? A person is who some who somebody is. So for us human beings. Everybody in this room, we all have a human nature, right? But not every one of us is the same person, correct? Right? How are we distinguished from one another if we all have the same nature? It's because we all have different bodies, right? And our, and our, and our souls, which are united with our bodies, right? We are individuated by our physical existence, right? Our bodies, okay? I don't know if you guys remember this last time, but I made a little comment that according to St. Thomas Aquinas, he thinks that angels, because they don't have bodies, they all have different natures. Because if that weren't the case, then there'd be no way to individuate them because they don't have physical bodies. <coughs> so every angel has its own unique nature, right? unlike us. We all share the same nature, but we all possess our own unique soul, which exists in our individuated bodies. Okay? The reason why I say this is because this is going to be important when we talk about this third principle here. If God, if Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they all have the same nature, that can't distinguish them from one another, and they also don't have bodies, then how can we really say that they are distinct persons? <laughs> You guys understand the question? I'll say it again. Okay. If the only way to distinguish persons from one another is by their nature or by a body, then how can we say that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit really are three distinct persons? If they don't possess a physical body and they have the same nature. I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna wait for Chandler, because he probably already knows the answer. Do you want to take a stab at it, Evelyn? I mean, number one, it was the Trinity was revealed to us through Revelation, right? So we have that, like that's how we know that there's three different persons. But then two, I would say that they're distinguished by their relationship to one another, right? So you could wow. say Christ has a physical body, so that's how we know the Son. You could say the Father has begotten the Son, so the Father is distinguished by his relationship to the Son. And then the Holy Spirit is begotten by both the Father and the Son. So the Holy Spirit comes forth from the Father and the Son. Did Chandler tell you what to say? <laughs> so I think we all need to give Evelyn a round of applause. That was amazing. Right? So yeah, so this is what, what the church ultimately decided through a number of ecumenical councils. Is that the only way to distinguish the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from one another is their relationship to each other. So that means when we say that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we really mean it. The Son really is begotten by the Father. And the Holy Spirit really is the relationship between the Father and the Son. The only way to distinguish them is by their relationship. Some people will explain it this way. They'll make a, a triangle. Okay. So this is the Holy Spirit, this is the Father, this is the Son, right? Okay? And 
basically the only thing that distinguishes all of these from one another is just how they're related to each other. Other than that, there's nothing different about their nature. There's nothing different about their will, their intellect. They all possess the exact same nature. The only thing that distinguishes them is how they're related to one another. Okay? Now this is important because, again, I'm probably... I know Chandler's going to ask this question anyway, so I might as well just talk about it. Right? Chandler, what question are you going to ask? Um, wait, when you, I'm sorry, I'm confused. What are you saying? The filioque. Oh, uh, yeah. Chandler's asked me about this a number of times. Okay. So the filioque. This was a, a big debate that came up around the year 1000 AD, and uh, Eastern Christians are still divided from us in the West. You talk to any Orthodox Christian or um, any Eastern Catholic, right? most likely, they're not going to assent to the filioque. What that means is that in the Creed we say that we believe in the Son and we believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Filioque means and the Son. Okay? Can you change markers? Yeah, use that black one. The, the blue one. The blue one? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Oh, man, this is... It's like a whole new world. Wow. I'm glad you said that. This is amazing. Okay. So we in the West, we say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. In Eastern Christianity, Eastern Orthodox, they say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. Through the Son. Okay? Now think about that. If the only way to distinguish the Trinity, to distinguish the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit from each other, is how they're related to each other. In the West we say that the Father... He gets the Son, and then the relationship between them spirates the Holy Spirit. Okay? So what makes the Holy Spirit different from the Son is that He doesn't just come from the Father. He comes from the Father and the Son. Okay? Am I making any sense here? So when we say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, that's what makes the Holy Spirit different from the Son. If they both came from the Father, they would be the exact same person because their relation would be exactly the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Well, what about the triangle that you just drew us right before that with the band marker? <laughs> because isn't that the same relationship? Um. The, when you talk about the triangle, it's not really describing the relationship, it's describing something else. It's just saying how you can talk about them. Right? So they're each God, but they're not the same. Right? The Holy Spirit is not the Son, the Father is not the Son, the Father and the Son are not the Holy Spirit. Okay? So it doesn't describe their relationship. Correct. Yep. All right. So if you ever hear anybody ask you about the filioque, all right, that's why we believe it. There has to be a way to distinguish the Son from the Holy Spirit. The Son only comes from the Father. Whereas the Holy Spirit comes from both the Father and the Son. That's how you know they're different. All right. So that's the filioque. Any questions about that? Yes, Evelyn? Did you say both like um, Orthodox and Eastern Catholic, like Eastern Rite Catholics, don't believe in the filioque? I need. I would need to review that, actually. Okay. Yeah, so Jim. Eastern Catholics hold the filioque. They just don't say it in the creed for cultural reasons. Okay. So they still have to dogmatically hold to it. 
Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Good question. All right. Um, so Orthodox Christians yeah. are Christians who basically believe everything that Catholics do, yeah. except for they disaffiliated with the papacy back in 1054 AD. Okay. Okay. So that means up until that time, they basically had all the exact same doctrines, all the same practices. Now because for a thousand years we've been separated from one another, we still look very similar but there are certain things that they would not believe that we believe because we've had a bunch of theological councils since then. Okay, but I thought you said that Eastern Catholics. Eastern Rite Catholics. So, yeah, so there's a, there's a distinction between Eastern uh, Christians the Orthodox okay. and Eastern Catholics. So, Eastern Catholics are Roman Catholics. So, they're the same as us. But basically, most Eastern Catholics, what happened was they originally split off in 1054 with the rest of the Orthodox Christians. But over the course of time, they've returned to the church. They've decided that they should be in communion with the Pope. So, now we call them Eastern Catholics. So basically, they would resemble everything about Orthodox Christians except for they now accept the authority of the Pope. Does that make sense? And just because they're Eastern doesn't mean they only exist in the Eastern part of the world. That just means where they're based out of, right? Like here in Crawfordsville, we have two Orthodox churches. Okay? So they would not consider themselves in union with Rome. When we say that we're Roman Catholic, that's what this means. It means that we recognize that the main authority on earth is based in the papacy. Right. So, so are the Eastern about. churches in Crawfordsville Eastern Catholics or Eastern Christians? They are, they are Eastern Christians. Okay. Mm -hmm. Orthodox. Yeah. Um, the closest Eastern Catholic church to us Indianapolis. is in Indianapolis. Okay. So if we were to go to an Eastern... Orthodox Church, does that fulfill our obligation? Does it count? Or is that a different type of faith? Uh, I, mm. Only in the state of emergency. Yeah. Okay. And we can also receive, the, no. we would say we can receive communion, right? But they wouldn't no. allow us to. Yes. I think is the case. Yeah. Well, I don't think you'd want to, though, because like when you're receiving communion, not only are you assenting it's truly the body and blood of Christ, but you're assenting you're in unity with the people around you. Just like if you went to a Protestant service and they had communion, you wouldn't receive it because even if they say it's symbolic and you understand it's symbolic, partaking of it is like with your body showing that you're in, in like, endorsing. Yes. Yeah. It's, a, it's a complicated question because Orthodox Christians, all of their sacraments are just as valid as ours are. <clears throat> right? So like different from Anglicans, for example. Anglicans believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, but Christ isn't really present in the Eucharist there. It's not a valid sacrament. They think that it's the body and blood of Jesus, but because they don't have a valid priesthood, it's not. It's just bread and wine. Yeah. So could it be likened to kind of like baptism, um, still being baptized in the Trinitarian formula, even though it wasn't in a Catholic church? <coughs> Yeah, so it's, it's not ideal to be baptized outside of the Catholic Church, but if you have no other option. And I think, that's how you would, I think that's how we would probably approach communion as well. If you lived in an area where there were no Roman Catholic churches and your only option was to go to an Orthodox church, right, that's going to be your best option. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think the rule with them is that we would allow them to receive communion in our churches, but they will not allow us to receive communion in their churches. Is that correct? So what's the Eastern um, Church in Indianapolis? Uh, Eastern Catholic. So, okay. Um, you know how different...
cultures have different practices? Like, yeah. yeah. Okay, so basically in the Catholic faith, we have different rites. So depending on where you're from, the way you practice might be slightly different. So um, Eastern Rite churches or Eastern Catholic churches, again, like Father said, they're rooted in that more Russian, Byzantine, that culture of the world. Are you so, asking what the name of the church is, or I'm what is that? I mean, how would I how would I know if I was traveling? Mm -hmm. Is it does it say St. Bernard's Catholic Church? Could that be an Eastern? I mean, it would say St. Bernard's Byzantine. It would say St. Bernard's Byzantine. Anything Catholic. that says yeah. Orthodox, I would probably not go to. That, but that's just my personal. Opinion. Okay, well, I'm just curious. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. Okay. Byzantine, yeah, Byzantine, right? If you, if you're if you're unsure. Look for the word Catholic somewhere in the name yes. of the church. Yeah. Yeah. So if it doesn't say Catholic anywhere, then I think it, there's a good chance it isn't. Because even a lot of them, I don't think they might not even call themselves like Orthodox. They'll just say. I don't think they'd say Orthodox. I think they'd say Byzantine, right? They'd say Byzantine, like Saint Athanasius in Indianapolis says Byzantine Catholic Church. So it's Eastern right. Yeah, the mo the most the most common form of Eastern Catholicism you're going to find at least here in the U.S. is called Byzantine. Right. Technically speaking, I, th I think I'm remembering this this number correctly. Technically, there are 26 different kinds of Catholic rites. So Byzantine is just one of them, right? Um, but there's a Maronite, right? There is um, an Ambrosian rite, right? And the reason why there's all these different rites is, like I said, at one point in time, all of these different churches, they broke off with Rome, and then one by one, as they kept coming back, Rome basically gave them permission to keep all of their traditions, and that's why it's called a rite. Whereas what you and I, what most of us are used to, we're used to just the straight up Latin rite of the Catholic Church. Which is what 95% of Roman Catholics are a part of. They're part of the Latin rite of the Catholic Church. That's just really interesting because I, I never knew, I guess I, did, I didn't know that. Yeah, you should check check out a Byzantine church sometime. Look up videos on YouTube. Their, their rites are really cool. It's, uh, so like for us in the Latin rite, um, you know, we use we use Latin in the vernacular. But like, if you go to a Byzantine liturgy, you're going to hear a lot more things like in Greek and Aramaic and things like that. Mm -hmm. right. So, is that considered the Greek Orthodox Church then? No, because it's still it's still Catholic. Okay. The the Greek Orthodox Church would be a part of this okay. label up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good questions. It must be. So, anytime I hear Orthodox, I just think they are not in communion. That's usually my default. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about Orthodox? Okay, it's not about Orthodox. I'm kind of taking you back to the beginning with my Oops. question. Okay. 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 I watched them all, and it goes back to Christology, and God is not limited by time. Mm -hmm. So why last rites or why last blessings? Couldn't you be blessed a year, two years, three years, five years mm -hmm. after death? Mm. And still have it in the eyes of God as the last rites or the last blessing to that soul. So she's asking the question: If if God is outside of time, and even His saving works is not limited by time, why does it matter when we're anointed? Right. Okay. Um, the answer is is be, well. Does anybody else want to try and answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, like, you, you can give someone last rites. Mm -hmm. Is that what we call it now? Or, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then they're, they are okay, and they, was, you know, they get better and everything, and then if they were to die two years later, <coughs> would you give it to them? Or, have or they already if they've never it? had it, and they've been gone for five, ten years, can they still receive a blessing that, not in the matter of our time span, but still would matter at... God's what do you mean when you say gone? Yeah. Like dead? dead for yeah. 10 years? Yeah, like if, okay, when my dad passed away, if he didn't have last rites, uh -huh. would that keep it from him having last rites now? 
Well, it's a question for public. Well, even if you would, even so I do you, think it's an interesting question, and, I, and I've never heard anybody ask that question before. So would you give last rights to somebody? If someone's been killed, and you go to the hospital and they're dead, do you go ahead and give last rights? Mm -mm. No. The sacraments are for people who are alive, mm -hmm. not for dead people. Okay. But that's a good question. We're getting a lot of questions about the sacraments, and I'm actually hoping to start about the sacraments later this evening, so this could be perfect. Well, the short answer to your question, though, Daisy, is that the sacraments really do have an effect on our souls, right? And our souls do exist in time. Right? And that's why when they receive the sacrament, it matters. God exists outside of time, but we don't. Right? But blessings, that could be, you know, without the sacrament, with like, like a holy blessing for their soul can be given at any time. Like you can pray for them. Yeah. Good questions. Very good. This is good, all right? We don't always have to be talking about the Trinity. Huh? If you guys have other questions, we can talk about your questions. That's good. Don't feel like you're distracting me. The worst thing would be to go through all these theology classes and to learn all this stuff, but to have the questions you guys really want to have answered, not answered. Okay. All right. So, talked about rights, about the Trinity. Um, just a, a couple more things I'd like to say about the Trinity before we move on. Is, first of all, how do we make sense of this? Right? How can we say that God is three and one at the same time? Right? We talked about his relations. But I also think there's some analogies we can make to it. Right? There are some other things that we know of that exist in a similar way to the Trinity. Right? Uh, one of the most famous examples, St. Augustine. He gave the psychological analogy. The first time I heard this, it was just it was just kind of mind blowing for me. I thought about this. Right? So again, as Aquinas says, the way that we Distinguish people from one another is by their physical bodies, right? And God doesn't have a physical body, right? What Augustine said is that if you think about it, it's actually the same way with our mind, right? Psyche meaning the mind or the soul, right? Our minds exist as one mind, but your mind has three different aspects. It has memory, it has understanding or reflection, and it has love. Right. Within your mind, which is one, you have the capacity to do three distinct things. You can remember things. You can reflect and understand about those things that you remember. And you can love the things that you see in your mind. So it's kind of similar to saying that God, right, even though God is one, he has these three different existences in a certain sense. Right? They can be distinguished from one another. So St. Augustine called this the psychological analogy. And I've always just thought that was really, really fascinating. Right? Another way you can make sense of the Trinity this, uh, this analogy comes from the late Pope Benedict XVI, God rest his soul. Right. He gave the analogy of the atom. So what this analogy means is that it seems really crazy to say that God is one, right? and he is the foundation of all being, he's the creator of all being, right? and yet to say that God exists in a relationship of three persons. Right? But what Pope Benedict famously said in his book, Introduction to Christianity, is that, ironically, the more we learn about science, the more we learn about our physical world, the more we can understand that it actually resembles the Trinity. This may look like one solid object, right? But as you all know, it's actually billions 
right, of individual particles existing in relationship to one another. Even the very foundation of, of, of all things that exist physically, right, is the atom. And even the atom, right, it exists in a relationship between protons, neutrons, and electrons. Right? So even though it appears, right, we really do say that it is one, and yet it exists in a relationship. And that's what God is like. And that's really cool, too. All right, so um, uh, the, la the last analogy about the Trinity, this was a favorite one of Pope John Paul II. He gave the analogy of a family. Right? God is like a family within himself. Right? Just as a husband and a wife produce children, right? and they all exist in one family, so in a similar way with God. Right? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit exist as a family. And that families are actually supposed to imitate the love of the Trinity. That's the, the family analogy. Okay. Some takeaways about the Trinity. I think it's important for us to remember. Right? The Trinity isn't just something to you know, reflect on philosophically. It really does make a difference in how we think about God. It makes a difference in a number of ways. First of all, it's one of the things that makes us unique as Christians. No other religion has ever understood God to be both one and three at the same time. That makes us unique. It also reminds us that God doesn't need us. I'll put that in quotation marks. God doesn't need us. And that's actually good news. It's not bad news. We know that God doesn't need us because God has never been lonely. He's always existed in a perfect relationship, in a perfect family. He lacked nothing. So why did he create us? Only because he desired to share his own divine life with us. Out of sheer goodness and generosity, he created us. He didn't need anything from us. So the reason why that's good news is because that can remind us. Anytime we go through difficult times in our lives or we're despairing about things, we're asking, you know, why did things happen to us? Did, did God forget about me? Does God care for me? We can be reminded of this. That if God didn't care for us, we wouldn't be here. He doesn't need anything from us. The only reason why we exist at all is because he wants to share his own divine life with us. And in every moment of our existence, God is still sustaining us in being. If God did not want us to exist, we would stop existing. We're kind of like the cell, right? And God is the brain. There are trillions of, soul, of cells in your body, right? and your brain is able to control every single one of them. Right? In a similar way with us, God sustains all of us in every moment of our existence. And it seems incomprehensible. How can God know me and everybody else in the world? But he does. He's able to sustain us in being in every moment of our existence. Right? Another principle... We are not called to simply coexist, but for communion. It's not uncommon nowadays to see on um, bumper stickers and license plates people talking about just coexist, right? We don't believe that God, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they just coexist, right, and tolerate one another. Right? And that's not what we're supposed to be doing either. Right? We're not just supposed to tolerate each other. 
We're supposed to have true communion with one another. Just as the Trinity has perfect communion. Another takeaway from the Trinity is that we are meant to be a self-gift. The Trinity, God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right, from all eternity, right, they've been existing in a perfect sacrificial love for one another. Right? They give themselves completely to the other. Right? In such a way that marriage, for example, here on earth, right, is just like a mere shadow compared to the way that God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are able to give themselves to one another. Right? They give of themselves perfectly. Right? Pope Benedict, in his encyclical Deus Caritas Est, he, he said this, this quote I'll share with you guys, one of my favorite quotes. He said, Love looks to the eternal. Love is an ecstasy, not in the sense of a moment of intoxication, but rather as a journey, an ongoing exodus out of the closed inward-looking self towards its liberation through self-giving and thus towards its authentic self-discovery and the discovery of God. So he said, love is a journey. It's an ongoing exodus out of the inward-looking self toward its ultimate liberation through self-giving. Pope John Paul II said in a similar way, he said that we'll never truly understand ourselves until we make a total self-gift of ourselves. We'll never understand who we are, who we're supposed to be, until we give ourselves completely away. And the Trinity is a, is a perfect reflection of that. That's one of the reasons why um, sometimes I kind of get a little bit critical about, um, in our modern culture, about how so many people are obsessed with, with psychology. Right? It's not that I don't think psychology is valuable. It's very, very important, very useful, right? But the point is, is that sometimes people will spend their whole lives trying to psychologically, introvert, introvertedly understand who they are, looking more and more inward at their inner wounds, when really, what they really need is to stop looking inward and make a total gift of themselves. Finally, We are destined for perfect communion with the Trinity. So someday, pray God, we will get to heaven and we will be perfectly brought in. Right, to this communion that the Trinity has. The, the church fathers, they used, to, they used to use a Greek word to describe it. They called it the perichoresis. That means the dance. Right. So it's hard to describe right, what, the, what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit what they experience all the time in heaven. Right? It's perfect communion. Think about the most joyful moments of your entire life here on earth and recognize that even in that moment, right, it's still just a shadow of what we will experience in heaven all the time. Right? And so they called it the dance. Right? So one day, we'll be invited into that perfect union. Any questions about the Trinity? Yes, Evelyn? I have a tough one. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. So this is a conversation I've had with a couple of my friends in college that um, we really struggled to kind of find the answer to. Um, but it has to do with that we are meant to be a self-gift. How do you balance self-gift with prudence? Because, like, obviously, like, 
we talk about complete gift of self, right? Um, and you can think of like Mother Teresa giving up all of her wealth and going and serving the poor, right? But say for the father of a family, right, he can't just like give all of his money away because he still has to take care of his family, right? So how do we balance like being a self-gift to others with also being prudent? Should that be a concern? Like, do you get what I'm saying? Do I need to rephrase it or something? I mean, I think it's just a prudential question. It's hard to answer it specifically. Okay. Anybody have any thoughts about that question? Though? Well, that's what the apostles were asking you. What do you say? That's what the apostles were asked to do, leave their families behind. So. So, in, so in some cases, right, it seems like that might actually be what we're being called to do. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, that's not what we're being called to do. Right? Um, I think it's better to think about it in terms of, instead of prudence, it's better to think about it in terms of responsibility. Right? Who do you have a responsibility to take care of? Right. Say that, yeah, Chandler? Yeah, the way I see it is that, like, once I have a family, and if I gave all my money away, that would almost be imprudent to my family. It would be irresponsible. Yeah, it would be right. irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then, like, and, and I agree. So, mm -hmm. so using a father was a bad example. Prior to meeting Madeline, or even why you two were dating, sure. why didn't you go off and give all your money away? And do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see. What you're in saying. that case, you don't have a responsibility as a husband and father and provider. Um, I think. Yeah, I think. Um, like you still need to care for yourself. Like that is imprudent as well. Like, are we to totally more like? I, I don't understand. Where does this lead? Like I, even Mother Teresa like still cared for herself a little bit. Of course, so. yeah. But like, I'm saying most of us don't live like her. Yeah, you know, totally. so should we be living like her? Like, um, no, I think I, mean, I think, I think everybody. I think everybody has their self gift, yeah. and it doesn't matter if it's Mother Teresa or I mean, you know, we're raising our grandson. So is that our gift? You know, to God because God, you know, gave us our grandson to raise. We don't think anything about it. But what I'm saying is, I think everybody, in their own way, is self-giving. I honestly do. And you may not realize it, but what you're doing. But I think if you got a good heart, you're self-giving. Is what I look at. It, so. Like yes, I did not give as much as Mother Teresa when I was single, but also like, <laughs> why not, Chandler? Uh, <laughs> I definitely did not do that. But like, should she starve herself? So like a total gift to others. It's like where does it end? Let's so I think there's another there's another way to put this. It's distinction between morality and sanctity, right? <coughs> Morality means that there are certain responsibilities, right, that we owe to God and to our families, to our neighbors, right, <laughs> acting in a morally upright way. Right? This is kind of like the way of seeing as like the minimum, right? Okay. God does not demand, right, that Chandler give away all of his money, even though he doesn't have any children yet, right? <coughs> God does demand right, that we don't steal, right, that we don't take advantage of people. Right? Those are moral standards. But then there's standards of sanctity. Right? And the beautiful thing about sanctity is that it's different for every person. Right? One of the beautiful things about Catholicism is that we don't believe in cookie-cutter versions of sanctity. There are saints who there are saints who fasted all the time, and yet there are saints who drank beer all the time. Right? There are saints who were cloistered contemplatives, and there were saints who traveled the world as missionaries. Right? There were saints who were wealthy. There were saints who were poor. Right? 
There's lots of different ways for us to live out the life of sanctity. And if you read the lives of the saints, or especially one of my favorite things to do is read about like modern saints right, from the last couple hundred years. Because what you see when you read about modern saints is that you understand that saints look a lot like we do. Right? It doesn't have to be completely out of our grasp. Right? Uh, saint Gianna Mola, right? she was a, a doctor in Italy. She's a saint because she was told that she needed to have an abortion in order to save her life, and she chose not to. That was her way of living out sanctity. Sometimes when we think about the saints and we think about like the Middle Ages, we think that to be a saint means you have to be in the church all the time, or you have to be a nun, or you have to be able to perform miracles. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of really inspiring saints who are actually very relatable to us. And so that's the beautiful thing about sanctity. If Chandler decided before he met Madeline that he really did want to give away everything he owned out of love of God, Go ahead, Chandler. Right? There's lots of different ways to live out sanctity. Right? And oftentimes, the saints, they do live lives in such a way that does seem unreasonable to most people. Right? Why would Teresa of Calcutta spend her entire life serving the poorest of the poor right? in a country where Christians were largely despised? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Wouldn't that also be like a self-calling like if you were, like I, Mother Teresa stated that it was a calling of hers to do that. So if you feel the necessity, like if you're generally driven for the necessity to get rid of, you know, relinquish everything you own and give, then that's the calling that you have. If it's something lesser, you know, not lesser, but, you know, support your family and do good deeds, I think that's kind of where. Yeah, some people, some people are, they feel the call to do something way more radical than other people feel called to. Right? But the fact still remains with lots of different versions. Even in, even in some of the religious orders, like the Jesuits. Right? My favorite religious order up until you know, 40 years ago. Right? Some Jesuits just became the most amazing scholars and they taught at universities. Whereas other Jesuits traveled the world becoming martyrs for the faith. Right? So even within the same religious order, there's a huge variance of what everybody was called to. So, yeah, Chandler? Yeah, so basically you're saying self-gifts, at, at least the purpose of self-gift is the same, like the motive is the same, but it just looks different for everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because yep. that's kind of what we talked about in religious ed is there's, what is it, three or four vocational paths, but the, it still looks different for everyone, at least mm -hmm. the, the calling of that vocation. Like my story of Madeline and I is different than someone else's, even if they're married. Kind of and I think the beautiful thing about it is that we can all, you know, we can decide in a certain sense. Right? What's the, what is the way that I want to make my life a beautiful gift to God? Right? And there's a certain creativity that God gives us the option to, to choose. Right? So, yeah. What do you say, Doug? <laughs> right, so she, she's talking about the time when I, I had... <laughs> thought about becoming a priest <laughs> and instead I went and married her and had nine kids <laughs> see I thought my life totally was a sacrifice <laughs> but really, it's yeah, I totally interrupted his <laughs> sanctifying plans <laughs> yeah I, w I really would. I would I would encourage each of you if you want to if you want to find like good things to read um, there's this two volume work it's called Modern Saints by this person named Ann Ball. And it's one of my favorite books because, again, it's just these little 10 page summaries, but it's of people who, you know, they didn't live a thousand years ago. Like, we have photographs of them. Right? Some of them, you know, people are still alive who knew them. Right? So their stories seem much more achievable or relatable to us. Right? And it's really amazing to see the, the various ways that they lived out their own call to sanctity. All right, I think we're going to take a break now, and when we come back, we'll start talking about the sacraments, okay? All right, take a five-minute break.
not to be named, so I won't name her to embarrass her, but it starts with an H. It ends with Hillary. Okay. Um, but she said that her son actually went to a Byzantine mass in Indianapolis, and he was blown away at how different it was, right? And so if you ever get a chance to go to a Byzantine mass, some of the things you'll notice is, as I already mentioned, you'll hear a lot of things in Greek and in Aramaic, right? Whereas in our mass, you really only hear Latin and English. Um, there's a little bit of Greek when we say the Kyrie. That's actually Greek, right? Um, you'll notice that they do communion differently than us. So they don't use little circular wafers in a Byzantine church. Instead, they take the unleavened bread and they cut it into a bunch of pieces. And then when they're giving people communion, they take a spoon, they dip it in the precious blood, and they give you it on a spoon. They do that because they want to have communion under both species. But unlike we in the modern Latin church, they don't want to just give people a chalice with the precious blood because they're afraid of something spilling. Right? So only the priest or the deacon is allowed to distribute communion, and that's how it's done. Okay? In the Byzantine church, they also, um, again, I'm pretty sure this is correct, but somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but they start giving people communion from a very young age. Unlike in our church where, you know, we do baptism and then people get First Communion when they turn seven and then they get confirmed later on, in the Byzantine church, they tend to do all three of those sacraments at the same time. Right. So communion is different. Um, they have something called an iconostasis in Byzantine churches. Right. So some of you might remember from the olden days that there used to be communion rails in every Catholic church, right? And the communion rail, it had a practical purpose of allowing people to kneel down to receive communion, but it also had a theological purpose in that it was distinguishing the sanctuary from the rest of the church. In Byzantine churches, they have a version of that that is even more significant and symbolic. They have what's called an iconostasis, and literally during the Eucharistic prayer, as the priest is consecrating the Eucharist, they close the doors so nobody can even see the priest anymore. And it's called an iconostasis. And on those doors, they have a bunch of depictions of heaven and angels and the saints. Right? And it's again, it's to symbolize right, that the priest is partaking in the heavenly liturgy at that time. So they call that an iconostasis. Um, something else you would notice is how much they use incense. If you don't like incense at St. Bernard, <laughs> you've never been to a Byzantine Mass. They literally, they walk around the church multiple times with incense. It's not even just in the sanctuary. They walk around the whole church, incensing everybody. Right? And then lastly, one of my favorite parts about the Byzantine Mass um, is the, the chant. So a lot of times during the Mass, as the priest is saying the prayers, basically all the people in the congregation are doing a bunch of different chants, like the chanting of the psalms and things like that. And it ends up being a really a beautiful way to glorify God in that way. Right? So yeah, if you've never been to a Byzantine Mass, I highly encourage you to check it out, just to, just to see it. Um, you might check out a um, traditional Latin Mass, too, just if you want to see like the, the different kinds of, of having Mass in the church. Um, the newest rite in the Catholic Church, I wrote this down here, it's actually called the Anglican Rite. Okay. Any, any guesses what the Anglican Rite is? It's for Anglicans who have decided to return to Rome, but they don't want to lose their liturgy. Right? So basically, it's an Anglican Mass, but it's with a valid priesthood, and it's with people who are in communion with Rome. Uh, Holy Rosary in Indianapolis uh, is the closest church I know of that has the Anglican Rite Mass. Right? Or at least it used to, if it doesn't anymore. Right? So those are, those are the rites. Okay? All right, now we're, gonna, we're just going to make an introduction about the sacraments. We're not going to have time to talk about all the sacraments tonight, but we're going to make some introductory comments. Okay? So when I was growing up in the, in the Catholic Church, um, when I was going through CCD and religious ed, um, I always kind of had a beef with the sacraments. 
I wasn't a big fan of my religious education. And the reason why is because when I was a child, my mom used to tell me a bunch of different Bible stories. And I thought the Bible was really exciting, and I loved to hear about the stories in the Bible. And when I would go to CCD, I'd want to learn more stories about the Bible. And I felt like all I learned about was all these rites and rituals of the church, the sacraments. And I felt like it was really boring. And I didn't understand why in religious ed, instead of learning about the Bible and about God's works, why I was always having to learn all this churchy stuff right, about the sacraments. Right? I don't know if anybody else shares that experience. That was how I felt. Right? Um, but now, you know, I really do think that the sacraments are extremely significant. Right? And the reason why the sacraments are so significant is because the sacraments are... God's saving works among us. We, we always have to remember that when we receive the sacraments, it's God's way of interacting with us now that He is in heaven. Right? He works through the church. Uh, an analogy of, of saying this, uh, Bishop Barron, he gives this great analogy. He says that when we think about the sacraments or we think about the church, we need to think about a general right, going to war. Right, a general going to war. When a general goes to war or into a battle, right, where does the general go? To the back. And he tries to go up to a high ground, right? So that he can see everything. The general doesn't go to the front lines of the battle because then he wouldn't be able to see everything happening. Right? And so as Bishop Barron, you know, he makes this great analogy that that's how we need to think about God and the sacraments. That when Jesus ascended into heaven, it wasn't that he was abandoning us and leaving us to our own devices. It's uh, that he was like a general, right, ascending into heaven. And now, Christ's saving work is extended throughout his church through the sacraments. When Jesus was here on earth, right before he ascended into heaven, before he established his church, in order to encounter in order to encounter God, where did you have to go? To Nazareth, right? Or Jerusalem, wherever Jesus was. Now, because of the sacraments, because God has ascended into heaven and now extends his presence throughout the world through the church, we can all encounter God right, in any Catholic church. Through the sacraments. So the sacraments are not boring. Right? It's God's saving works now among us. Right? <clears throat> Another thing to remember about the sacraments is that we need the sacraments <clears throat> to participate. In the kingdom of God. I know I've said this before, but I just want to reiterate <clears throat> that there is a, there are a lot of things that we do as Catholics that other Christians think are very strange, and they think they're very weird. Oftentimes, when Wabash students, for example, when when they'll bring their Protestant friends to Mass. Right? Their friends will say, it just, it's so different than what I'm used to. Right? Because we use incense, because we have vestments, because we have altars, because we do things in Latin, right? all these different things. Right? It seems strange. It's important to remember that almost everything we do as Catholics, it comes from this idea that we are in the kingdom of God. Right? That in 2 Samuel 7... God promised to King David. God promised to King David, the same David who killed Goliath, the same David who wrote the Psalms, the same David who had the affair with Bathsheba. God made him king of his people, and God promised to David through a covenant in that chapter that his kingdom would endure forever. 
and that one day one of his descendants would claim the throne of that kingdom, and it would become an everlasting kingdom. So when Jesus was here on earth, he was always talking about the kingdom of God, right, the kingdom of heaven. And most modern Christians, when they hear the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, they just think that it's talking about heaven. Like someday we'll get to the kingdom of God when we get to heaven. That's not what we mean as Catholics. The kingdom of God is the kingdom that Jesus has already established here on earth and that continues into heaven. That we are already participating in the kingdom of God here on earth. The kingdom of God exists in heaven and on earth. It's not just in heaven. And this kingdom of God, right, we call the church. Because that was one of the other names that Jesus gave to it. He called it the church. And so because we're living in this kingdom of God, which actually is really none other than the kingdom of David, right, renewed. Does that make any sense here? Any sense here? Mm -hmm. Right? There's a reason why when Jesus was born, everybody called him the son of David. They were referencing that fact that Jesus was this promised descendant who is going to renew the kingdom of David in such a way that it would endure forever and it would be even better than the kingdom of David. But if you think about that, that explains why so many of the things we do in the church that seem strange, it's because they're actually referring back to the kingdom of David. So why do we as Catholics, why do we pay so much attention to Mary? Why do we pray to Mary? Why do we bow to Mary? Why do we honor Mary? It's because in the kingdom of David, great honor was paid to the queen of the kingdom. And the queen of the kingdom was not the king's wife, it was his mother. We've talked about this, right? Because in the kingdom of David, oftentimes the kings would have, you know, multiple wives. So you can have multiple queens. Everybody just had one mother, right? Uh, in David's kingdom, if you wanted to encounter God, did you just go to your inner room and open up your Bible and pray? No, you went to the temple. Right? And so as Catholics, yes, it's good to pray, it's good to read the Bible. But if you really want to encounter God, you have to go to the temple. You have to participate in the liturgy, in the Mass. Right? In the Catholic Church, we, we don't just have preachers and ministers. Right? We have priests. We have clerics. Right? We have bishops, priests, right? and deacons. Right? In the kingdom of David, you had the high priest, Then you had the Levitical priests. And then you had the Levitical ministers. Right? Our priesthood in the Catholic Church resembles the kingdom of David. Right? So in a similar way, right, as Catholics, why, why do we believe in the sacraments? Because we are participating in the sacraments of the new kingdom. And in the kingdom of David, they also had their own version of the sacraments. You had to go to participate in the Passover and the Pentecost liturgy. You had to even confess your sins to the priest, it says in the book of Numbers. So the sacraments existed in David's kingdom, and so they exist in our kingdom as well. Most modern Christians, they don't believe in the sacraments. Or if they, if they believe in the sacraments, they only believe in one or two of them. Right? They might have baptism. They might have marriage. They might even do some form of communion. But they don't have confession, anointing of the sick, holy orders. Right? And they think that we're strange for having all these things. But we're not being strange. We're just recognizing that we are in the kingdom. And just as the old kingdom had sacraments, so the new kingdom will have sacraments as well. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Father, you seem to 
seem to think that being strange is a bad thing. <laughs> I think it's a good thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think it's important that we understand why we're strange. Right? All right, so just to close, I'm just going to give a basic uh, definition of the sacraments. Right? Sacraments are um, external signs. External signs instituted by Christ which give grace. Okay. <coughs> which give grace. Or another way to say it is they are efficacious signs of grace. Okay. And I'm realizing we are running out of time. So um, I'll just, uh, just explain this word here, grace. Does anybody have any idea when we talk about grace in the church, what, what do we mean when we say grace? When we say grace, what do we mean? <clears throat> So grace, a good way to think about it, is grace is like holy gasoline. <laughs> it's like, in order to be holy, we have to have grace, right? The more grace we have, the more holy we can become, right? The more grace we have, the more united with God we are, and the more powerful we are. Many of the saints, they were able to perform amazing miracles, like being in two places at the same time, or hearing confessions in languages they never heard, or reading souls, right? or raising people from the dead. Right? It's because they had so much grace <clears throat> that they were able to start even doing the same miracles that God does. So when we talk about the sacraments... We're saying that the most important thing to know about the sacraments is that they are instruments of grace. They give us immense amount of graces. There's a reason why exorcists, for example, always say that the most powerful thing anybody can do is not receive an exorcism, but rather go to the sacrament of confession. Because by receiving the sacrament, you're receiving something a hundred times more powerful than a prayer of exorcism. Sacraments are extremely powerful. Right? And I think that's where we're going to close off for tonight. Are there any questions? Yes, Evelyn? Could you define grace a bit more? Like, I feel like I've heard in the past that it's like, like the life of God within us, maybe? Yep, or that's exactly it. Yep. Okay. So... I give the gasoline analogy just because I think it makes it easier to understand. But literally speaking, at least St. Thomas Aquinas, the way he describes it is the life of Christ within us. Right? It's us becoming more and more united and like God. Right? So yes, that's another way to describe grace. So an grace. increase of grace would be an increase in unity with Christ. Yes. Oh. And then also, when we say we're in a state of grace, right, it means we're united with God. Right? When we're not in a state of grace, it means that that union with God has been ruptured. We call that immortal sin. Right? Okay, I think, uh, Hillary, do you have announcements? Um, class next week, and then March 3rd, I sit it out on a clock now, but March 3rd, after the 9.30 Mass, Father is going to go over the sacrament of penance. Yep. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that next week. But all of you going through RCIA... Uh, you should be planning on going to confession. Right? So we're going to talk about that after the 9.30 Mass. And I'll just explain more what that entails and give you guys some pointers about going to confession. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And are you taking people's pictures tonight, Hillary? I, I'm not. Are you done? All right. Great.
Thanks, everyone.